Welcome to the house of a marine scientist. My name's Hadley England and I'm a marine scientist based out of Sydney, Australia. As someone that's really passionate about coral reefs, when I'm not in the lab or out on field work, you can find me here in my home where I have two marine tanks. So this tank right here is probably my favorite one. This one is the third marine tank I've ever had and it's actually the first one I built completely from scratch. To build this tank, I used an extruded aluminum frame. This is really good as it's corrosion resistant and really light and strong. I then cladded the frame in a marine ply and then painted the whole thing with aqua enamel. This means that the entire cabinet is really resistant to water, which is what you want in a marine tank. However, I wanted something that was a bit different to everything else out there on the market. So what I did was I countersunk the main aquarium into the cabinet, as you can see here. And then I also put a bunch of shelves on underneath and put some lighting in it as well. This means that the aquarium can be integrated quite well into the living room, which I think is helpful because my wife is an interior designer. So she really likes to have things that suit the space. The tank itself is 900 by 550 by 600 high. And along the back here, I had to custom drill in some holes so I could fit this weir into the back of it. This weir allows the water to go from the top of the tank down into the bottom of the sump, where I have a whole lot of filtration devices, doses, filters, all that sort of stuff. And then a pump brings the water back up the top through this pipe here. That means that all the ugly stuff is hidden down below. As for the fish in this tank, some of the fish in here I've had for probably five or six years now. That blue tang up the back I got when he was very, very little. He's starting to get a bit big now, so I might have to start looking at a bigger tank to get for him. But some of these fish, so the clownfish, I've also had for about four or five years. The blue chromis in there, I have also had for maybe three or four years. I've also got two yellow gobies. Um, they're really cool because they actually lay eggs. I haven't managed to keep any of the eggs yet because when the eggs hatch, they're in a larval form, so they often just get eaten by all the other fish in the tank. I've also got two cardinals. I've only had them for two or three years, but I think they're quite old because they're starting to show their age a bit. Um, what else have I got in here? I've also got a wrasse. So that wrasse I've had, oh, I couldn't even tell you, probably two or three years as well. He actually came out of an old system which I took over as well. I've got a coral beauty there. He's the blue and orange one. He's probably my favorite fish. Um, they're just really pretty. They're really quite peaceful. They do their own thing. And that one's quite unique too because it's got a lot more blue on it. So it's a bit different than the typical ones we get here in Australia. I've also got a Talbot damsel. He's that little guy right there that's blue and yellow. Normally damsels are quite aggressive. However, that guy has actually been really, really good. So I keep an eye out in a lot of shops to see if I can ever find any more. I haven't been very successful in doing that. Um, so if you know where I can get some, please, please leave a comment. As you can see, I've got three clams in the tank. This one just spat a bunch of sand everywhere. That clam I got from Monsoon Aquatics and I also got it when it was very little. I've had it for about three years now and it's grown, grown pretty well. I've also got this one here, which I got from a friend that shut down his tank. And then I also got this one here from Monsoon last year and he's grown a bit as well. Apart from that, I have also got two shrimp in the tank. I've got a red line cleaner shrimp and a coral banded shrimp. The red line cleaner shrimps are really good because they help to get all the parasites off the fish. So if you've got um, fish like tangs and stuff like that, which are prone to parasites such as ick, they're really beneficial for those because they can help get all the little parasites out of their gills and they not keep, help to keep your fish quite healthy in the tank. I'm a really firm believer in trying to maintain the health of fish through the health of the environment which they're in. In the ocean, when fish get sick, no one's there to give them medicine or to manually remove parasites from off, off them or anything like that. So why would we wanna do it in these marine systems? So instead I try and mimic what happens out in the wild. So in the wild, you have all these sorts of organisms that work together. So things like the red line cleaner shrimp, that in the wild they help to clean all the parasites off all the fish. 
Things like having wrasses in tanks are really good too because wrasses will actually remove a lot of parasites off corals. So if you've got things like flatworms or red bugs, these wrasses can be really good at maintaining the overall health of corals. I know a lot of people don't really like having crabs in their system. I have a few little Possilopra crabs that live in a lot of these corals. And whilst they can agitate the corals sometimes, I actually think that they help to maintain the health of the corals by removing parasites as well, because it seems that every coral I've got in here that's got a crab living in it, I've never had any issues in terms of disease or anything like that. So if you're a scientist working on crabs or crabs and their symbiotic relationships with corals, please message me because I'd love to learn more about it. But apart from all the livestock in this tank, I, as you can see, it's mostly hard coral dominated. Um, I do have some softies up the back there. And while softies are a lot easier to keep, I do find that when you're limited by space, they can be a bit problematic because they tend to sway a lot in the water and then sting other corals. So that's why I really like hard corals is because they're kind of almost like a bonsai tree and you can just like trim them back slowly. So as you can see, it's mostly Acropora dominated. I've got a few large uh, colonies of Possil Opera, like this one up here. His, oh, I couldn't even tell you how long I've had him. His, he was in one of the first tanks I ever had, so that was probably seven or eight years ago. So that original colony is very, very old. Um, I've got a little hammer garden down here. So a lot of these hammers I've actually rescued from tanks which have been shut down. Up the back, I've got some Goniopores. As you can see, my clowns absolutely love them. I've tried putting in enemies and stuff in this tank before and the clowns refused to host in, in the enemies. They'll always just go straight to the goniopores, which is really funny. Especially at night when the goniopores are all sucked up and the clowns are just sitting there hugging a little rock. I've also got some seriatopora. I've got a bunch of zoas along the ground. I've got morphs. I've got some fireworks, polyps. And I've also got some lobophilias right in the center there. That, big lobophilia there I've had for about five years as well and he's probably one of my favorites. I rarely see them in that color. But as you can see, I've got most of all my Acropora and Possiloporas up the top here where they get a lot of light. Up here, they're getting about five to 600 par just because they're so close to the surface. So you have to remember when light comes through water, um, it loses its strength really, really quickly. So in that top sort of third part of the water, the, the light still got quite a lot of energy to it. But then by the time the light gets down to the bottom here, it's more about two or 300 par, which is still probably more than enough to grow acropora and stuff. Like as you can see, I've got some acros on the bottom, um, but ultimately they need a bit more light than that, which is try, why I try and keep them up at the top there. Um, in terms of cleanup crew, I have a bunch of strom snails. So strom snails are really good at turning over the sand bed. A lot of comments I get on Instagram are, how do you keep your sand so clean? It's strom snails. They are constantly turning over the sand and picking out little bits of algae. So I highly recommend adding some to your tank. You can never have too much cleanup crew. And what I mean by cleanup crew are things like urchins, um, algae eating snails and strom snails and stuff like that. Not zombie snails. Zombie snails are great at just eating dead or decaying matter, but to be honest, most things will eat dead or decaying matter in these reef systems. So they're, whilst they are cool, they don't really qualify as cleanup crew. I really like tuxedo urchins, especially small ones, because they are super great at getting into tiny nooks and crevices to eat any algae that's growing in there. So in this tank, it's, it's hard to see, but I've got, I think it's about 10 to 15 urchins in this tank. And generally they come out at night too, so you can't really see them during the day. But they do a great job at keeping all the algae down. As you can see, this tank is directly behind this massive window. And these blinds are generally open during the day. So whilst it does get a lot of natural light, which I think is actually beneficial for the coral, it does get a lot of algae growth as well. However, because I have so much cleanup crew in this tank, it keeps it at bay and I never really have any issues with algae. Yeah, apart from that, I've also got a automatic fish feeder up on the top of the bar there. And that just feeds pellets once a day. Um, it's good just to sort of have a consistent amount of food coming into the tank. Yeah, but apart from that, that's kind of it with this tank. It's um, getting quite full now. I think I might have to get 
a new tank in the future. I'll be sad to see this one go, but I think I might be time for an upgrade soon. But now I'll show you my other tank over there. And this other one is a really special one because it's the first time anyone's ever done anything like this in the world. So let me show you. So this tank is really special because it is the world's first upside down reef tank. So I got this idea when I was out on a reef one time because I saw all these corals sort of sitting upside down under these rocks. And I thought, how could these be growing down towards the light? But then I realized that there was all this sand under the rock work and this light was shining down onto it and reflecting back up onto these corals. So I thought, what if I put some lights underneath the tank and they shine up? So in this tank, I've got some lights not only above the rock, but also underneath that are shining back up at it. And I've had this tank now for, oh, I think about six months. And as you can see, the corals are growing down towards the light. So this idea works. So corals will grow towards the light. And I think it's a really cool sort of artwork as well. So with this rock, I actually had to make it from scratch. So to make this rock sort of float, I used an acrylic backboard and then I made some little arms that come off it and then clattered the whole thing in rock. And then because that rock is really, really heavy, I was worried that it would fall off the back of the wall. So what I did was I actually put a bunch of water bottles filled with air inside the rock. So that actually makes the rock were quite buoyant and is only just heavy enough to sink. Obviously now it's got a lot more coral on it, so it weighs a lot more, um, but it's still very, very strong. So in this tank, I've got a mix of LPS and SPS. I've got a bunch of hammers and stuff on the top and the bottom. I've also got some goniaporas, which I took out of my other tank over there. I've also got a bunch of acropora, seriatopora, montopora, and everything like that. As you can see, I've also got some small chromis. Whenever I buy chromis, I try and buy them as a large group. A lot of people message me and they're like, oh, how do you keep your chromis together? They're always killing each other. And the tip is to get a large group of chromis when they're very little and then they grow up with one another. And because the group is so large, if there is any bullying or anything going on, it's often spread between all of them. Additionally to this, also try and feed them as much as possible. Chromis are incredibly hungry. And as you can see here, they think they're gonna get fed. They're like the little puppy dogs of the ocean. They'll just follow you around everywhere. And sometimes it gets a bit annoying because they come up to look at my tank and I wanna watch what the fish are doing. I just want them to act natural, but they never do because they always think they're gonna get fed. As you can see, I've also got some domino damsels in there as well. I think their days in the tank are numbered because they are quite aggressive and I'm just really worried that they're going to start attacking the rest of the fish in the tank. So far they've been alright, but I know that day will come. I've also got another yellow goby in this tank, although he hides quite a lot and I'm searching for a partner for him currently. Some really cool fish I have in this tank and you probably would have seen on previous episodes. I've got some upside down assessors. So these are blue assessors and they're generally found in the wild underneath sort of caves and overhangs and stuff like that. And they actually swim upside down. So I thought they would be the perfect addition to this tank, but they are also quite shy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna put some food in this tank and that will hopefully encourage them to come out. So stay, stay with me. Okay, so whenever I feed my tanks, I use a combination of frozen food, um, as I think it's just sort of the best quality and you don't wanna be feeding pellets to them all the time as not all fish will eat the pellet food. Oh, here we go. So this guy knows as soon as I brought the food out, he came out. So there should be four assessors in there. So I'll just put a little bit in and that should encourage the rest of them. There we go. There's another one. There's another one down there. So you can see how quickly they come out when they sense the food there. So they must always just be watching for that food. I should probably also go and feed the other tank because you can probably see they're all getting a bit antsy in the corner there. For anyone who thinks that fish are not smart, you only have to watch this to realize how good their memory is. I've been feeding them with this cup for the last two years now, and they are really great with color or at least pattern recognition or something because they will follow this cup around everywhere. They are like little puppy dogs. They always know when it's feeding time. And whilst they look incredibly hungry, and they probably are, don't think that I'm ever under feeding them because these guys get fed a lot. 
And sometimes I have to actually dial it back because they start getting a little bit too fat, but fish are opportunistic and they'll just keep eating and eating and eating. So if you've got fish at home, and you think they're getting a little bit fat and you're having issues with water qualities, it's probably best to just sort of stop feeding them as much. They're not gonna, they're not gonna be struggling at all. But now I'll put this in. There we go. And they'll, they'll eat this very quickly. It will only take them a few seconds. So thanks everyone for watching. If you want me to do more videos like this, or if you have any specific questions about my tanks or my systems or my work or anything like that, please leave a comment below. And yeah, thanks for watching.